Welcome. I'm Elisa New, host of GBH's Poetry in America television series on PBS. And I'm also a professor and the creator of courses at Harvard and now at Arizona State University. These are online courses that reach lifelong learners of all ages, including high school students and K-12 teachers across the US and around the world. Thank you all so much for joining us for the power of poetry. We are so excited to be celebrating National Poetry Month with you, and I really can't wait to get started. Today, we are joined with a, by a wonderful and impressive panel of poets, all of whom are local to the Boston area. I want to say a special thank you to Mass Poetry for partnering with us on this event and for securing today's fabulous poets. More to come a bit later about uh, how you can get more involved with Mass Poetry and some exciting announcements about their upcoming poetry festival. One second. Having a little technical issue for a second, but no, here I am. Before we get started, we want to explain how this will work. I know some of you may be new to Zoom, so let me remind you that you won't see yourself on video and you will not be able to speak during the interview, but we do want to hear from you. You can ask questions by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your question. You can put your questions in at any time during the event, and I will try to chime in with your questions for the panel as they arrive and as they fit into our discussion. So if you have questions, you can just start putting them right into the Q&A. If you see a question that you want to hear the answer to yourself, you can vote for it by clicking the thumbs up and you can move it up to the top of the list. We will do our best to ask the most popular questions. Zoom has also recently rolled out an, automa an automated captioning feature. And we're excited to also offer this to you so everyone can enjoy our events. Uh, to use that, to turn on the closed captioning feature, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Two transcription display options will pop up. We recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript. A sidebar window will open where you can see what each speaker is saying. And please bear in mind, of course, that closed captioning might be slightly delayed. And now it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's esteemed panel of poets. First, we have Chen Chen. Chen Chen is the author of When I Grow Up, I Want to Be a List of Further Possibilities, which was long listed for the National Book Award and won the Tom Gunn Award, among other honors. Chen Chen has received a Pushcart Prize and fellowships from Kundeman and the National Endowment for the Arts. With his brilliant team, he edits the literary journal Underblong. He teaches at Brandeis University as the Jacob Ziskin Poet in Residence, and he lives in Waltham, Mass. with his partner, Jeff Gilbert, and their pug, Mr. Rupert Giles. Hi, Chen Chen. Hi, it's great to be here. Great to see you, welcome. Uh, our next guest is Daniel Legros-Georges. Daniel, Danielle, sorry, I'm going to do that again. Danielle Legros-Georges. Danielle is a writer, translator, academic, and the author of several books of poetry, including The Dear Remote Nearness of You, which was the winner of the New England Poetry Club's Sheila Margaret Motten Book Prize. Danielle is a professor in and the director of the Lesley University MFA program in creative writing. And she taught in the Joyner Institute for the Study of War and Social Consequences. She was um, 
uh, which is at the University of Massachusetts. She did that for more than a decade. She was appointed the second poet laureate of the city of Boston and served in the role from 2015 to 2019. Welcome, Danielle. Thank you. Very happy to be here this evening. I don't see you yet. Where are you? Does everybody see Danielle? If you use the arrow. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. There's, there's Danielle. I'm going to put everybody in gallery. Um, finally, I am delighted. Thank you all for your patience with me. Um, finally, I am delighted to introduce Portia Olayuwala, Black futurist, poet, dyke, hip hop feminist, womanist, Portia is a native of Chicago who now resides in Boston. Portia Olayawala is a writer, performer, educator, and curator who uses Afrofuturism and surrealism to examine historical and current issues in the Black woman and queer diasporas. She is an individual World Poetry Slam champion and the artistic director at Mass Leap a literary youth organization. Portia is an MFA candidate at Emerson College and the author of I Shimmer Sometimes Too, which is out from Button Poetry. She is the current poet laureate for the city of Boston. And finally, uh, before we get started, I just want to express my regret that Dara Wire uh, is not able to be with us tonight. There was a family emergency and Dara had to um, attend to that. All right, having now gotten all of the formalities out of the way, um, I am excited to begin to uh, converse with this extraordinary group whose poems I've been reading and learning from um, all weekend. I, I think that at an event called The Power of Poetry, we have an opportunity to think about what that, not to take that term too casually uh, or as a cliche, but to think about what the power of poetry is and maybe to think about the different kinds of power that poetry uh, has bestowed on all of us as we've embraced it, the power of poetry throughout time, the power of poetry as it helps us reinvent our world, represent our cultures, tell our secrets, tell um, our truths. Um, so, I thought we could start by talking, um, especially with Chen Chen, uh, whose um, work is so wonderful in this connection, uh, in that it, it claims a kind of power that is in some ways the power to be timorous, <laughs> the power to inhabit a vulnerable persona, a, uh, a searching persona, the persona of someone who buttonholes others on Poplar Street, uh, as, as you do Chen Chen in Poplar Street, whether that's you or that persona who buttonholes uh, people and tries in some way to find a home, a place of comfort, a common language. What I enjoy so much about your poetry is that you always seem to be kind of, and this is a phrase you use, trying it out, <laughs> trying, trying it out. 
even trying out what is the right, what metaphor for yourself you might actually feel like you fits or or you deserve. So I've been I've been running on a little bit about the uh, extraordinary kind of power that that a, a persona or a lyric speaker of the kind you inhabit has the way it has of claiming our attention. So over over to you. And so, so could you talk to me about that power? And at any moment you feel that you'd like to, would you read us um, from a bit of your work? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Lisa, for that wonderful question. It's so great to be here tonight, um, these amazing poets, um, and to engage in this conversation. Um, my thanks to Mass Poetry and to GBH for hosting us. Um, so yeah, the power of poetry. I mean, poetry saved my life. Uh, I think maybe that sounds cheesy or overdramatic to say, but I really mean it. I don't think I would be here today if it weren't for poetry, um, writing it, reading it, um, discussing it, finding community through poetry. Um, all of those have saved my life and enriched it uh, immensely. And so, yeah, I wouldn't be here today. And I don't think I would be me today, um, the fullest you know, possible version of me, um, which I think poetry makes possible. So for me, poetry, Poetry's power really resides in that creating of space, creating, expanding, insisting on space in which we can really be our fullest, most alive, most complex selves. And I think that uh, often for me growing up as someone who's queer and also Asian American, multilingual, immigrant, uh, these identities uh, weren't supposed to sort of inhabit the same space. I couldn't be all these things all at once, whether it was uh, at home or whether it was in school. And so poetry became this outlet for me to really uh, embrace um, all of those identities and all of those experiences. And I love thinking about how, I mean, the very word stanza, right, comes from the Italian word for room. And I think about the rooms that poetry allows us to move through. Um, and I just, yeah, I gain um, such a um, sense of capaciousness uh, because of poetry and uh, really seeing how the ways in which I identify, the ways that I experience the world, encounter others um, is uh, enlarged and emboldened. By can, I, can I provoke you for- yeah. And, and then ask you to read. And I, I, you, your poetry enlarges me, but it, in part of the way it does it is by giving space to being really humorously small and insecure. <laughs> I mean, you, so he, this is you um, from self portrait as so much potential, dreaming of one day being as fearless as a mango, as friendly as a tomato merciless to chin and shirt front, realizing I hate the word sip, but that's all I do. I drink so slowly and say I'm tasting it when I'm just bad at taking in liquid. Now, <laughs> you've been describing kind of owning the room, and the, but the wonderful way you own the room is with a voice that um, maybe you could read us a little bit more in that voice. We could talk a little bit more about it. And then maybe Danielle and Portia, um, we could all talk about poetry and, and voice. Yeah, I think that the expansion of space um, through poetry, for me, really happens through embracing vulnerability. Um, and that includes flaws, insecurities, anxieties. So yeah, I think I'll, I'll read this poem, Poplar Street, that you mentioned earlier. I love this poem. Poplar Street. Oh, sorry. Hello. Are you on your way to work too? I was just taken aback by how you also have a briefcase, also small and brown. I was taken by how you seem secretly to love everything. Are you my new coworker? Oh, I see. No. Still, good to meet you. I'm trying out this thing where it's good to meet people. 
Maybe beyond briefcases, we have some things in common. I like jelly beans. I'm afraid of death. I'm afraid of farting, even around people I love. Do you think your mother loves you when you fart? Does your mother love you all the time? Have you ever doubted? I like that the street we're on is named after a tree when there are none, poplar or otherwise. I wonder if a tree has ever been named after a street, whether that worked out. If I were a street, I hope I'd get a good name, not main or pleasant. One night I ran out of an apartment down North Pleasant Street. It was soft and neighborly with pines and oaks. It felt too hopeful after what happened. After I told my mother I liked a boy and she said, no, you're sick. Get out before you get your brothers sick. Sometimes parents and children become the most common strangers. Eventually a street appears where they can meet again or not. Do I love my mother? Do I have to forgive in order to love? Or do I have to love for forgiveness to even be possible? What do you think? I'm trying out this thing where questions about love and forgiveness are a form of work I'd rather not do alone. I'm trying to say, let's put our briefcases on our heads in the sudden rain and continue meeting as if we've just been given our names. So, so lovely, Chen Chen, and I, um, you, you are a poet of trying out who um, sort of discovers all the space in that voice of trying out, all the courage uh, that it takes to actually utter trying out. And because I'm mindful um, of, of the clock, I'm going to, I, I think, ask Danielle, who is also a poet of trying out, <laughs> if you might um, reflect a little bit on voice. Um, in, in a moment, I'd like to really ask you about your, what for me as a new reader of you, I see as kind of your stylistic signature, which is the crafting of po poems that have spaces in between, <laughs> uh, that leave a lot of space for wandering in and for inquiries into very mysterious matters. Um, but if, if possible, could you, could you reflect a little bit on, on voice? Your voice is so different from Chen Chen's. Mm, voice. Well, uh, yes, it is different from Chen Chen's. Um, and uh, Chen Chen's voice is, is extraordinary and, 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 and beautiful. I think um, we, we share this notion of uh, speaking our truths uh, uh, and uh, also uh, poetry as a space of inquiry. Uh, that's certainly um, how it operates and it has operated for me as a poet. Uh, I have lots of questions about, about the world, about uh, about human nature, uh, about animal nature, about culture. I too, like Chen Chen, uh, am, an Im am an immigrant. And so I was, uh, when I moved to the States as a, as a young person, I was negotiating two very different cultures and the subcultures within those cultures and, and attempting to make sense of it all. And I found that um, th that poetic space and the, the space of art allowed me to wrangle, to wrestle with those, um, with those complicated um, ontological and epistemological questions. Uh, and so um, uh, um, back to the question of voice. <laughs> the, the, well, you, but you led, can, I'm gonna jump back in because I'm so excited that you said ontological and epistemological, even though they're very big and scary words, because you are a philosophical poet. Right, uh, you you are a poet who asks us to consider what's between our name for a thing <laughs> and the thing itself, and who invites us to uh, to think about you know being what you know what is before human beings name it and think about it. Is is that would would that be um, a, a reasonable impression that I have formed. Yes, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I mean, um, Audre Lorde um, 
you know, uh, states that poetry is a way to give name to the nameless. And, and I think that my, my poetry is, is an attempt to do that. Um, and, and I wrestle with language um, as carrier of, of meaning, right, as a way in which we, we uh, think about the world and, and, and ourselves, right? So, um, so would you read, would you read us because that's so clear in your poems that the language feels placed <laughs> in a way in at almost and composed and you, you use one of the poems you've shared is called a still life and still lives are, are composed and they often sit on a tabletop and you're, you're, there's a slightly estranged quality, a beautifully estranged quality that your, your lines have so that we feel, we very much feel the space in between them. Please read us something. Still life with orbs. Between the thing and the name of it is a world and a world behind this world. There is my mask placed on the table. There is the wooden table and the space beneath it. There is an orange on the floor when it should be on the table in the yellow basket meant for oranges, but which contains a cat licking one front paw. What do cats know of oranges? What do birds know of water unless they plunge their beaks into it, breaking some poor fish's sleep? What do fish know of birds except the slash of bill, the sudden flash, the stop? Such, such an extraordinary poem and in some ways like Chen Chen's in that discontinuous worlds, you are both poets who remind us how the poetic imagination can toggle between discontinuous worlds as in fact our imaginations, our unconsciouses, everybody's minds do. Everybody's minds have these weird, discontinuous, disparate objects from different um, galaxies you know, moving at the same at the same time, and um, our our worlds are so enriched in both of both of the poetries that the two of you produce by glimpsing behind <laughs> what you know what's in the background or or seeing what's been brought um, brought to the foreground. I think I'm supposed to quickly welcome, <laughs> I'm supposed to quickly re-welcome re anyone. I'm sorry, I'm being a little meta about this. Um, if you are just joining us, welcome. We are celebrating National Poetry Month with a panel of local, uh, really inspiring poets from the Boston area. And a reminder, if you want to ask any of the panelists questions at any point during the conversation, you can use the Q&A tab that is located in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I will do my best to get to your questions as they come in. I'll do my best to do that in a, in a timely manner. Um, Portia, you are in your way. I was, I um, so enjoyed, I've so enjoyed getting to know your, your work. And while Shen Shen seems to me a poet that a beginner might, might say, uh, learning about poetry could learn a huge amount about how poets use voice from Shen Shen and a huge amount about thinking <laughs> in poetry and the examination of thought in Dan Danielle's work. Your, um, your poetry is thematic and full of, it, it, has, it has themes, it tells stories. Um, and one of the stories it tells again and again 
is a story of dancing. <laughs> and so, and I was thinking about you as a poet of dancing and thinking about all of, you know, there's an inner artistic quality as well to your poetry where your other art forms are in dialogue with your poetry. And some of, some of the power of poetry I think comes from that. Is it fair to ask you um, about dancing? And as I ask you about dancing, dancing has form. Um, we, we were talking in a way about Danielle's use of carefully placed and your poems are formally very deliberate um, and careful. So love to hear about dancing. Yeah, um, excuse me, I live on a very busy street, so somebody's decided to have a party um, as soon as you called on me. comment from the audience, Portia, please read your dancing. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, yeah, um, super grateful to be here. Um, the fun fact is that I don't actually dance. I danced pretty poorly. Um, I'm not ashamed to admit it. Um, but I think that's probably why I write dance poems, mostly because I'm interested in um, what it means culturally to almost any culture, right? Dancing is this other kind of poetic form, if you will, uh, of that the body gives off. Um, and so I don't know, I'm, I'm really interested in joy that is associated with dancing and examining that joy um, in the context or uh, next to um, some of the joy that doesn't exist, if that makes sense. Yeah, that that the, to travel the distance between lack of joy and joy seems to be something you say dancing will do for us, right? The electric slide or twerking <laughs> may take us on a journey. And because you write poems, um, that that also take us on journeys. They they dance, right? They. Um, I'd I'd love to talk more about dancing, but I think everybody wants to hear some. Um, hear you read. I'm hearing more. <laughs> That's great. Um, yes, I will be doing a dance poem. Not a dance, but a dance poem. Um, this is. Um, kind of an ode to my partner who sometimes just burst out in dancing. Maybe I'm cooking or maybe there's some really an intense political situation happening on CNN. Um, but either way, she's dancing. And um, yeah, this is homage to that. It's called Twerk Villanelle. And it's for Valentine. My girl positioned for a twerk session. Knees bent, hands below the thigh, tongue out, head turned to look at her body's procession, she in tune, breath in, breasts hang, hips freshen, she slow wine, pulse waistline to a beat bled for her, ungilt the knees for the session, fair saint of vertebrae, backbone blessing, her pop in innate, her pop out self-bred, head locked into her holy procession. Dance is proof she loves herself. No questions, no music required, no crowd needed. She arched into a gateway protecting. This dance is proof she loves me, no guessing. A Bronx bedroom and we hip to hip threaded. She turned to me, tranced by her possessing. She coils herself to and calls forth a legend. Round body booty, bounce a praise ballad. She break hold, turn hold in a twerk session, body charm, spell bent toward progressing. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so extraordinary. And as you've started to read, I was thinking, well, there's a poet with voice. <laughs> and then I was thinking, what do you mean you can't dance? I mean, because you were you were reading with your body, right? That there there's an embodiment, your hands. It was just your hand was was dancing and your head and your neck. <laughs> 
Um, just how, you know, I, I find it so fascinating when, and, and so many people who don't know poetry are so confused by whether it's this, it's print on a page. <laughs> what is it? Is it print? Is it really print on a page that you read? Or is it really out loud with your body through your vocal cords that turns up on a page? Any? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll just say, I mean, I think it's definitely a combination of both. Um, I, I can't recall um, who said this, but um, there is a saying that, it, you know, a poem is not done until it's read aloud or read in a room or off the page. Um, and, you know, as a person who, who's traditional or who's first started in spoken word or slam poetry, um, I often think about the lineage of my own work, but also just poetry in general. And, you know, oftentimes I think back to, <laughs> this is kind of embarrassing to say, but oftentimes I think back to Shakespeare, okay? Um, and just like this, um, this famous writer, poet, playwright, whose work was oftentimes not even written down for actors. You know, they, they kind of just went out there and performed and it was meant to be done once. And hopefully you were there, you know, you were there to catch the live performance. So every time I think about work um, or my work, I often, even as I'm writing it, have to read it aloud to hear what's happening, you know, as I, especially as I'm making edits. So I will definitely say it, it feels like, um, a combination and there's a, a particular joy and, and agony in both of them um, and both the page as stage and vice versa, so. I am going to take a everyone on a very short break uh, and welcome to the screen, Jamie Reese, who is going to explain how you can support WGBH and all of the programs and events that GBH has to offer. Thank you, Lisa. And thanks to our audience for spending some quality time with us tonight as we celebrate the power of poetry during National Poetry Month. You know, viewers and listeners turn to GBH for many reasons, whether it's to hear powerful poetry, learn the latest news, or to simply be entertained for a while. If GBH is your go-to source for news, culture, and entertainment, then please consider making a donation. Tonight, if you give $6.25 a month as a GBH sustainer or $75 all at once, we'll send you the Poetry Lovers Bundle. And you are gonna want this because it includes the, some of the beautiful poetry you are hearing tonight um, and, and print collections from each poet we are so lucky to have joining us for this event. If you already have the bundle, well, there are more thank you gift options to choose from on our website. So right now, if you look in the chat tab, you'll see our website address to make a donation. It is gbh.org slash support events. And again, you can make a donation in any amount. Every dollar at GBH makes a difference. Simply click on the support link in the chat tab now or text GBH to 800-492-1111. You know, giving just takes a few minutes of your time and a few dollars on your credit card. And since we make the process so quick and easy, those few minutes will now become hundreds of hours of informative news and smart, thought-provoking entertainment. Really, it might be the best use of your time tonight. So if you're already a GBH member, we all wanna thank you so much for your support. If you wish to become one tonight, just click on the support link in the chat tab now or text GBH to 800-492. One, 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 one. And now back to Lisa and our fabulous poets. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be uh, continuing this conversation with all of you. And uh, I'm going to click my little arrow and there you all are <laughs> again. Um, I have been um, just informed that there are questions from the audience that we are starting to get. And I'd like um, to begin to fold them into our, into our discussion. Um, why don't I start with 
all of you um, with, a, with a question that we've already been talking about. Um, an attendee asks, what is your writing process? Do you write when the spirit moves you? Uh, or do you sit down every day, handcuff yourself to your desk? <laughs> Which way does at a particular time, do you have a ritual? How does it, how does it go for you? And I wonder, we could, have, we could even just do a little lightning round and see uh, how different you all are. Portia, how about you? How do you write? Yeah, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I am uh, extremely motivated by deadlines. Um, and so if there is a deadline, there's nothing else that gets me writing faster. Um, but then also when the spirit, when, when outside of the deadline, when the spirit hits me, um, I think that's when I, when it feels most good, when it feels most fun, um, when I feel most vulnerable, I think that's a word somebody else used. And also when I'm like interested in that moment, moment of inquiry or of discovery. So I think it's a combination of, uh, both of them, but mostly deadlines. I'm embarrassed to admit. How about you? How about you, Chen Chen? Yeah, I don't have any special rituals. I'm really envious of writers who do have like really interesting rituals. Like I think the French writer like Flaubert like to keep a drawer of like apples and like smell them before he's trying to write. Um, I don't have anything like that. It's really just in between all the other things that happen in life, other responsibilities. And yeah, if I'm just moved um, by an image um, or a scrap of language, a phrase, often I'm inspired by conversations that I have with friends. Um, so if someone says really uh, something really funny or insightful or just the way that they say it, um, you know, the body movement that they make, a gesture um, will really inspire me um, or I'll be watching a show and there'll be a conversation on it that I find really interesting. So I often start um, from conversation. How about you, Danielle? Yes, for me, when the spirit moves me, when lightning strikes me, when something in the world inspires me, uh, art often uh, inspires me. And then, of course, when I have a project um, I'm working on, then I, then I sit down at the desk and try to devote X number of hours each day uh, to, to the project. Um, I, this, this is a question to all of the writers and um, and, but especially, or perhaps first Portia, the question is how did you find the freedom to write yourself in poems? And I, I, it's interesting to think about what that, what, what that really means, finding that freedom. Yeah, I don't, um, I'm sorry. I'm just like meditating on that question. Um, I don't know that I found that freedom yet is, is really where it's at. Or I'm like constantly searching. Um, I, simultaneously, I also think, I don't know if this is true, but I feel like a lot of poets, first book is usually uh, more about the self. And the second one is usually about something else, right? Um, same is true for a lot of like musicians and singers, you know, the self-titled album. Um, I don't know, I, I, it's not like a choice I made to write about the self, but it's just something that I had to do, you know? Um, and I'm so glad, glad to be done with it, to be writing about <laughs> different things now. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it just had to be done. I had to start with myself. Um, you know, the, the poet A.R. Ammons, I've been doing some work on, when asked why he wrote, he said, anxiety. <laughs> and um, some freedom must stand in some relationship to anxiety, but in some ways anxiety feels to me truer to how some of it really feels. Chen Chen, you, there's some anxiety in your poem and, and Danielle wrote this also, this extraordinary poem about looking at an eel. About, <laughs> it made me so fascinated and so anxious at the, at, the, at the same time. But somewhere between anxiety and freedom, could you, either of you or someplace else, where does it, where does it come from? Um, yeah, like Portia said, I mean, it's an ongoing search for sure. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, one source for me was definitely uh, taking a poetry workshop um, in college. I think this was my first one. It was with um, Martina Spada um, at UMass Amherst, and it was just an amazing class. And just the sense of permission 
that he gave, um, you know, direct permission, just saying, yeah, you can write about being an immigrant, you can write about your family, you can write, you know, the truth um, of your own experience. So him just saying that, and then also the reading that he had us do, we read from this wonderful anthology called uh, Poetry Like Bread, um, Poets of the Political Imagination, and included bilingual, multilingual poems. Um, and so, yeah, I felt a great deal of um, freedom um, to explore what uh, makes me anxious, so to speak, um, to really dive into those complexities. Danielle, your um, the poem you read to us, it, it's sort of there's a perturbation in it, right? It's it's, it's sort of a prob things are not quite right, and that seems an important engine for you. Yeah, I'm I'm really interested in in tension. That, you know, I think in that poem I'm uh, exploring the tension between um, seemingly incompatible worlds or creatures or experiences in worlds that don't sort of overlap or understand one another. Um, ultimately, of course, with the goal of attempting to, to have some, some, some overlap or, um, or, or understanding between the two. Um, and, you know, in response to the question of self, I, I, um, I, I happen to be, I'm a very private person. So I, while I sometimes write about the self, I think it's, um, I'm also writing about, I think I'm writing about sort of a, a broader perspectives. You know, I may write about myself as 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 a woman, but sort of with you know thinking about the the you know the gender more broadly, or as a black woman and thinking about the experiences of black women, or as a Haitian, which I am, and the experience of Haitians. So, my hope is that my work is not only personal, but but also more broadly reflective of particular communities. Works. And you, the, things happen off stage in your, <laughs> in, in your poetry as, you know, between the lines and off stage, the, one of the poems that's in the bundle that um, is being offered in, in one of your books ends with a, a grandfather holding a flashlight, a light, a light, and the personal potency, the emotional potency of that, um, that image, especially placed at the end of a poem, a grandfather holding, um, holding a light, um, is an extraordinary way of being personal in a way that where, where you in some way remain somewhat off, off stage um, and, I love the way all of you as poets experiment with somewhat oblique angles on your experience um, where Chen Chen imagines a different departure from China <laughs> than, the fa than his family, in fact, the, than was true in his family. And, and Portia imagines had her father not been deported um, these, um, these, these stories that never happened, but do happen in the poem, right? And that poems are places where things that never happened happen, right? Another, another dimension. We have someone um, here in the chat with a question and any of you, if you like questions, please grab them. But, uh, a question about who has influenced their work. And I, I was going to ask something similar of Chen Chen. I was thinking about the role of the teacher for poets. Um, poets, you know, people who become orthopedic surgeons don't tell to always talk to you about their teachers necessarily, or who become mail carriers. There's a there's a particular kind of relationship to prior poets, and often to teachers. Wonder, Portia, could you look like you have something to say there? No, I'm just reflecting and thinking. Um, but if anybody wants to take this one, please. Um, OK. If not, OK. Chen Chen, is that you sure. unmuting? Yeah, I can jump <laughs> <Okay>. in. <laughs> um, 
yeah, I mean, Martina Spada, as I mentioned, yeah, definitely very influential. I took a class with him that also focused on political poetry, um, another class that focused on Pablo Neruda's work, um, which became really influential, particularly for the range um, in Neruda's work, um, where you have love poems, you have political poems about the Spanish Civil War, you have odes to everyday objects. Um, that range is just incredible and really inspired me um, early on as I started to delve deeper into reading and writing poetry. Um, and then I got to work with uh, Aracelis Gramai um, in my final year of college as well. Um, and was very much influenced by her work. Um, someone from the past um, who's been a big influence um, on my writing is Frank O'Hara. So the way that he uses the conversational tone, um, focuses on sort of everyday life, relationships, and pop culture references as well. Mm -hmm. the, that idea that you can write a poem, what does he say? I do this, I do that, <laughs> right? I see that whatever, whatever is around. Um, there is, there's a question in the chat. There's several questions in the chat, in the, in the Q and A about form, about poetic form. Um, and, and they're asked in different ways about rhythm, about scansion. Um, and I think all of you would have something to say about that. You, Portia, write a villain, maybe the world's only villanelle about twerking, I must say. I think there's little competition there, although it could happen. Um, the villanelle has a particular rhythm that you are working what, with, against, or start anywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to just highlight that quite one of these questions that says, you know, at first when they read the poem, they didn't like it. And I have to tell you, me either. <laughs> um, and I'm like constantly tweaking that ending. I have, still haven't found it. Um, but yeah, I'm totally into form. I totally dig it. Um, and mostly because I, I, I like to think I'm rebellious. Um, I, I think I play in, by the rules my entire life. I've always been like a nerd, a good student, all of these things. But I think really to get within and to break, right? I, I'm like really interested in form to know it, to understand the lineage of it, but to, but to also figure out ways to be rebellious within it, whether that is the topic of twerk villanelle, right? Like one of my professors, when I turned that in, he was like, I've never seen these two words next to each other. And you know, that that is the fun for me, that it's really the fun. Um, and also just really inspired by um, Jericho Brown, who, you know, invented his own form. So I'm, I'm really interested in form as tradition, but also um, as a futuristic tool that we can use to, to shift the canon. And is it fun to write a villain? You know, a villanelle is a form with very strict rules and you actually follow them <laughs> to a very large extent. Yes, it is. It, I think it is a lot of fun. I, I, I think of it as a puzzle sometimes when I'm writing in form is, you know, how to figure out how to get these particular rules to do this. And like, even for example, the villanelle, I might be wrong, but you know, traditionally is um, Italian country song, you know, and I would argue that twerking is, you know, of a country song of sorts, right? So yeah, I really, I really dig sticking with the rules of it. Um, but then eventually, you know, <laughs> we break them. Yeah, yeah. And, and how about you, Danielle, if you have a, um, your, as I said, your, the formal qualities of, of your poems are so are so clear, they're almost sculptural. And I think you've said the visual arts are important for you. Yeah, I mean, I do consider um, the free verse poems that I write uh, as, as, as um, sculpture. I, I consider their ar the architecture of the poetry. And I, um, and for the longest time, I, I, I think I was a minimalist. I wanted to just like, to, to get down to the most basic to the most essential quality of whatever it was uh, I was pursuing. So removing any extraneous matter, getting down to the most condensed, compact, um, you know, jewel or- Theme. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, so structure um, is very important to me. Uh, and, and you've both described structure in, you've described it in, in, very different ways. Um, one as a 
a kind of, as part of craft, the pleasure of craft. And, and, and I'm sure that both of you would say each of these things is of interest to you. But Portia, you were stressing um, tradition, right? Form uh, forms traditional qualities in the way in which you can be responding um, to tradition. And and it for for readers of poetry who are confused by it, and especially confused by what can feel the unnaturalness of form. I think it's great um, to to have the examples. Uh, that the three of you give Chen Chen too, and you've you've told us something important by saying that Frank O'Hara and um, the kind of oratorical Martina Spada, <laughs> who th these are not reductive; these are not poets who try to clean everything up and shave everything down. You you have a different formal. Um, it, it sounds like a different formal set of models. Yeah, I really write toward mess <laughs> and embracing that. Um, just letting a poem be as messy as it can be, um, writing towards surprise. You know, I want to be surprised myself um, through the act of writing and want to discover something. You know, another way that I know a poem is done is if I feel like I've really learned something that I couldn't have possibly learned without having written that particular poem. Although I would say that like I'm also influenced by traditional forms, certainly, and maybe one uh, that wouldn't come to mind immediately just reading my work is the sonnet, um, which I don't really write in. I tend to write these much longer sprawling poems, um, but I love the sonnet for, in particular, it's um, emphasis on that turn, the volta, right? The major turn that happens. Um, and it's through reading and studying sonnets, including very traditional ones, um, that I feel like I have learned so much about uh, the importance of that kind of revelation or that epiphany or that um, shift. And it can be a tonal shift. It can be a shift within an image, um, a shift within a sound. Um, and so that's really important to me as I work too. That's that that's so interesting that we we wouldn't have imagined that you were a devotee of the of the sonnet. And yet every poet, every poet when they get serious learns to value the volta. That something has to change, something has to turn over um, in a poem. I and I I think that sonnets also are among those forms that it is great to read on the page because they have again an architecture that you can see. You can see where the turn, where the turn is, if it's eight, eight lines and then six lines, or you can see where the various turns are if it's three quatrains. Um, so, so, so interesting talking to all of you. We, we only have a few more minutes and I haven't, um, and we haven't talked about the pandemic um, or poetry um, as it has um, become an important resource around the world. People who um, didn't think they cared about poetry are, are caring. And maybe a question I could ask is, when did you start realizing that you as a poet had a different place in our society? You know, it might be it might be not you know entirely visible, but but I, I think you've you've become a different kind of person in the in the eyes of many uh, during during the pandemic. Poetry, instead of being this weird roundabout way of saying things <laughs> uh, that a lot of people don't understand, has become something else. What has it become? How, how are you reacting or feeling that? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, I was thinking a lot about, um, so the poet Paul Ceylon, um, who wrote in German and um, in the wake of World War II and the Holocaust, he's a survivor of the Holocaust, um, both his parents were killed. Um, so this earlier um, period of great loss, um, and he often writes from loss and from grief, but in this incredibly inventive way. Um, and he said something really stunning, um, which is a poem is a handshake. 
um, which, yeah, I think usually um, for those maybe not familiar with poetry can seem like this impenetrable riddle that you have to you know, solve. Um, but I love this idea of a, a poem as a handshake. And during this time of the pandemic, it also makes me think about, right, uh, the lack of physical contact, right, touch, um, how uh, we've become, you know, the term touch starved, you know, there's touch hunger these days. And I, when I think about the poems that most deeply move me, they feel like a physical experience. They feel like an embrace. It feels like I'm being held uh, by the poet's voice or by their choice of imagery. And there's this great intimacy to that. Um, so yeah, I just love that idea. And I felt like um, during this time, it's just become more apparent to me um, that poetry can have that role. Um, it can be that embrace that you need. That's so lovely, Chen Chen. How about, how about you, Danielle, and poetry in the pandemic? Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll start with a little bit of background. Um, I, I think about the Haitian engagé tradition uh, of literature, uh, the engaged tradition um, that, um, that has political dimension that is not devoid of aesthetic um, considerations, right? Um, you know, that has existed in the 20th century and, and, and before that, the poetry of witness, the poetry of engagement, the poetry of, of protest, um, the, the, the poetry in face of, of the difficult. So that has always been, I think, certainly part of Haitian literature, but I think also a part of, of, of African-American and, and Black um, diasporic literature. So poetry as, as divorced or, or, or far away from what's taking, what's, you know, what's actually taking place in people's lives is not, um, is not something that it sits easily, I think, within these traditions, right? So poetry is, for me, certainly, is, is not this weird thing or esoteric or impractical. It can have very, very practical implications. And it's often the thing that we turn to, I think, across cultures in, in times of great joy in times of great loss too, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the pandemic is, is this particular moment that we're experiencing. I think people are turning to poetry. Um, we saw Amanda Gorman as the, the wonderful young um, um, poet for the inauguration of, of Joe Biden who really um, electrified people and inspired pe folks and, and really reminded us of the, of the power uh, of poetry um, in in this time. So I, I think uh, there's great interest in poetry um, in the pandemic and sort of, you know, before it and, 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 and certainly I know but beyond it. Thank you. How about you, Portia? I think we might let you bring bring this conversation to a close. Oh, that's a lot of pressure. Um, okay. Well. No, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, no, I will say I definitely have been getting more calls for commission poems. Like a lot of people mm -hmm. want poems written about things. And I, and I want to go back to something Danielle said earlier on by way of Audre Lorde, um, which is, you know, poetry is giving name to the nameless, right? For it is through poetry that we give name to those ideas, which are until the poem nameless and formless um, about to be birthed. And I think about that in the context of the pandemic and the context of these protests that um, keep happening and the, in the context of these politics that we keep living under. Um, and all of these things feel really absurd and really nameless. I don't think any of us have ever experienced anything like this before in our lives, me personally, for sure. Um, and so I don't know, I, I, I have to correlate that name, the namelessness of the world around us to also what the work that poetry does, um, which is attempting to reconcile what we're all experiencing, so. Thank you so much for that beautiful summation. Um, this has been an incredibly interesting and inspiring conversation. I love talking about poetry with poets. <laughs> uh, I like it more than just readings myself. Um, so I so I really um, loved this. So I want to thank you, Chen Chen, Danielle, Portia, uh, for having this conversation with us. And um, I uh, wish you. I feel I feel that I that physical hug thing. 
that Chan Chen was uh, talking about. Um, and I want to say to the audience that we hope you all find yourselves busy and inspired and reading more poetry as National Poetry Month continues. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, bye bye to all the panelists. And we will bring this to a close. If you enjoy expressing your artistic side, whether that be through conversations about poetry or literature or a more hands-on approach, then GBH has another perfect event for you. Uh, you can join GBH on Saturday, May 8th for Paint Like Bob Ross, <laughs> an instructional paint night where there are no mistakes, just happy, accidents. Registrants will be sent all they need to complete their masterpiece. You can visit gbh.org events to register now and see all the events that uh, are upcoming on WGBH this spring. The Massachusetts Poetry Festival returns May 13th through 16th, uh, 2021. The 2021 festival will be the first uh, since the 10 year anniversary celebration in 2018. It's now a biennial event and the festival will once again showcase an all star roster of poets from across the Commonwealth and the country, including more than 50 total events featuring well over 100 plus poets. It's a wonderful thing to check in through the day. Um, even if you can't stay for the whole thing, just come in and out. In addition to headline readings, panels, workshops, and performances, this year's virtual festival will include past favorites such as the State of, the po State of Poetry panel, the small press fair workshops, poetry and yoga, along with some new events like an audio walking tour, a poetry and pets event, the 2020 redo celebration ceremony, and an online ekphrastic poetry gallery. Um, I, want, I want personally to thank all of you tonight who, who have joined uh, and who are members of GBH, especially major donor and leadership circle members. If you're not yet a member, um, you are encouraged to become a sustainer today so that GBH can continue to provide unique virtual experiences and remember that if you do so tonight at $75, you will receive GBH's Passion for Poetry bundle. Um, we all look forward to connecting with you again and hope that you and your families are staying healthy physically and emotionally during this time. Good night. <laughs>